Hey, I, uh, welcome to Greater Hope Church. That was really good, wasn't it? Well, we are we are live and online on Facebook Live, and so uh, we let's give our Facebook people a great big hand clap as they join us this morning. Thank you for being here with us, and uh, we got a great service. We hope our service is a blessing to you today, and. Uh, um, if you are a first-time guest here today, those of you who are in-house, you know, please pick up uh, one of these communication cards. And uh, if you have any new information, new cell phone number, or new contacts, please uh, let us know what's going on there. Also, uh, we have a, a first-time guest uh, information card to kind of explain to you a little bit about our, our church and our ministry here. And and uh, I also want to welcome our, our first-time guest online. We want to really want to thank you for for being a part of our service today. And uh, we haven't forget, you know we don't want to forget about you because you are an important part. You are our congregation. And so thank you for for being with us, joining with us today. If you are a first-time guest online, would you please simply text the word hello. Text the word hello at 254-307-0705. And when you do that, we can simply contact you, send you information about our, our church, about our ministry here. And uh, get, you know, any questions that you may have, we, we would love to answer that for you. So, again, thank you for joining us online, all of our online guests. And, uh, of course, everyone here today, thank you for, for being with us today. Um, i got a qu couple of quick announcements uh, First thing is that I got some new uh, handout cards, and so uh, I've made one that says you're invited, and also made another one that says Greater Hope has come to Colleen. These two cards, I would like to in invite you all to take a few of these home with you uh, today, and so that you could pass those out, take them to your business, or take them wherever you go, take them to the grocery store, and just put it in someone's hand, waiting in line, saying just invite them to come to church, you know, just be open. You know, we, we shouldn't be a secret service disciples. We need to be out there, right? We need to be out there and, and, and not be afraid. You know, you don't have to stand on the corner and, and, and uh, stand on a rock and, and preach hell, fire, and damnation. You know, we just simply love on people, you know? And so this is just a way to say, hey, we'd love to invite you to come to church. The information, all the information is on here, so you don't have to do much talking, but uh, that's a, just a good way of, of uh, getting in touch and, and contacting and, and connecting with people. Good news, we are on Google Map. We are on Google Map. Hey, all right. So if uh, as you talk to people, say, hey, man, just check us out on Google Map. And uh, we also have a church app. We also have a church app. So if you go to your app um, uh, store, wherever that is, and look for Church by Ministry One, look up the word Church by Ministry One. And just simply, I think they'll have you type in Greater Hope Church, and that will take you to it, okay? So Church by Ministry One, it's in the App Store, it's free, and uh, just download that. And uh, on our app, you can, uh, you know, our sermons are on there, our past sermons are on there, our messages, uh, our in basic information, uh, giving on, uh, is on there as well. And so, uh, uh, yeah, check that out, put that on your phone. Uh, we are in the midst, uh, we, had, we had a meeting Friday night with some of our, our core team members, and uh, we are planning uh, different events that we're going to want to do from this point on. As I mentioned last week, uh, last week we had our relaunch, and uh, because of the pandemic, we have been locked up in our living room for the past year. And so uh, I, I kind of kid about it that uh, you know, I have our, our camera and it was online service. And so I was preaching to my, to my wife and my daughter and my dog. And uh, it's, it's a little difficult just looking to a camera and imagining more people, but we know that there was a lot of people watching us online and we'll continue to, you know, we will continue to provide our services online. And, and again, thank you again for joining us today. So, um, but we are planning some, some activities that are going to minister to kids, to minister to children, and to minister to adults. And so we want to really, uh, God placed us here. And, and you guys are at, in the groundwork of, of something great. And so, it, you know, you, you may say, man, we got some empty chairs. That's okay, because those chairs are going to be filled. And, and it takes faithful people that are going to be willing to, to roll up their sleeves a little bit and get involved and, and help make this ministry work. Because we know that there are people, not just around this area, but throughout Killeen, the greater Killeen area, that don't know Jesus. In fact, I think I shared this with you last week that um, I, you know, I'm teaching in an elementary school, 
And uh, last week after Easter, I, I asked my kids that came to my class. Um, I got six periods all day long, and, and uh, uh, so I'm seeing two, 200 kids a day. And so I asked the kids, I said, you know, how was your Easter? You know, oh, it was great. You know, I said, did you get some candy? Yeah, we got some candy. I said, well, how, how do you all celebrate Easter? You know, do you do the Easter bunny thing and candy? And, of course, all, all the hands went up. And I said, just out of curiosity, how many of you guys celebrate Easter by going to church? And only about two hands went up. Only two hands out of 200 kids. And, and that just blew me away. And I think, wow, it, you know, we are in a world that, that God is not a part of our, our lives. And, and so we know that we have an important mission right here. There are people that, that you probably know and don't even know that they don't go to church. They don't have a relationship with God. And, and so that's why we, we're doing this. And so my wife and I and my daughter, and you know, we're all working secular jobs right now until we can build this, this ministry up. But we know that uh, it is so important that we reach our community, so important that we reach people's lives. And so we are planning some events. We, we, we know that kids are important. Uh, those of you that may not know us, Sharon and I have been kid pastors for over 30 years, and we are passionate about young people. We are passionate about young. We know what God can do in the life of, of, a, of a child. And uh, from our own experience, we've seen kids come to the Lord, and we've seen those kids bring their parents so that they can come to the Lord. And so kids can have a tremendous uh, uh, effect on, on their family. And so kids' hearts are so open. I love kids. They, they will be so brutally honest with you, you know, and, uh, but I love that about them, and, uh, but they need the Lord, and so we are doing things or planning things that will, will minister to kids, and so uh, we are looking for volunteers. We are looking for people to get plugged in, not just with kids and youth ministry, but ushers and greeters and sound people, and eventually we're going to have a band up here and, and all that kind of stuff, amen, and so uh, right now we're we're depending on these videos and, and my beautiful wife and her beautiful voice. And, and uh, so, you know what, it, it's all about here anyway. You know, we could have a 20-piece a band, and, 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 uh, but if, if it's not coming from your heart, um, and if it's just about the show and the lights, man, we're missing it big time. You know what, we really are. And so uh, I hope you're with me on that. So be in prayer about uh, our, our kids' ministry, about our youth ministry, about helping out in any way, you know, if, if all you want to do is vacuum the rug, I'll have you vacuum the rug. That would be take one thing off my list to do, amen? And so uh, thank you for, for being that. Um, th there is a form back there that says join our team, and so if you want to check that out on the back, there's little uh, things that you can check off if you're interested in anything like that, so uh, take one of those, that's in the back. And then finally, I want, one more announcement is... Uh, Every Wednesday, we have what we call 7.14 a.m. Wednesday prayer call. 7.14, there it is right there. Uh, what, what this is is basically at 7.14 in the morning, we have a, uh, a prayer time, a, pr a prayer conference call. And so you can call in, just dial that number, there's an access code, and simply listen to uh, Rob as, he's, as he leads us in prayer over a variety of things. We're praying for our community, we're praying for uh, people's lives and, and jobs and, and everything like that. So um, this is an important time, this is kind of our corporate prayer time. You don't have to say a thing. All you have to do is just listen and be in agreement and with that. If you have a prayer request, you can let Rob know here today, or you can do it on the phone as well. And uh, but it's a, a prayer. I mean, you know, Sharon and I have been doing a lot of listening to to do messages about prayer, and God really kind of. Um, man, my toes hurt because I feel like I, God really corrected me as far as how important prayer is. Man, it's prayer that opens up the windows of heaven. It's prayer that we, that we connect and, and, and be a part of what God wants to do. And so as a lot of times when we pray, we, we ended up praying, God, help meet my needs instead of God, show me what you want to do. So uh, 714 in the morning. Just call that number. If you, if you don't have any way to write that down, you can go to our Facebook page. That information is on our Facebook page as well. So uh, we would love for you to, to, uh, to be a part of that. In just a moment, we'll be taking up an offering. If you would like to give uh, and you need an offering envelope, just simply raise your hand and we can get that in your hand. If you don't, don't want to give that way, that's fine. But if you do, just raise your hand and we'll get that in, uh, to you. 
Uh, there's several different ways that we can give, and so uh, especially those that are watching online, we really are so thankful and grateful for your support. Uh, we, we know we have people that are still being cautious because of the pandemic, and so um, we certainly respect you for, uh, for, for you know, being careful. But uh, we do need your support. There's, there's several different ways that you can give. Uh, one, you can simply text to give. Text the word give at 254-306-0705, and that will take you directly to our giving page on, on our website. Or you can go straight to our, our webpage at greaterhope.church, and there you can just kind of click on a tab and, uh, and give that way. Or you can do like I do, the old-fashioned way, is write a check, right? Write a check and uh, make it out to Greater Hope Church. And uh, uh, if you're mailing it, you can mail it to Greater Hope Church, Post Office Box 12023, Colleen, Texas, that's 76542. And uh, we want to thank you for doing that. Before we take up our offering, I want to share with you uh, uh, a little um, segment of a book that uh, I bought several years ago. It was called Living in the Fog by Mike Evans, Living in the Fog by Mike Evans. And uh, uh, he wrote, fog is, means favor of God, living in the favor of God. Does anyone want to live in the favor of God? Well, I know I do, I, and that's why I, I got this book. Actually, I got two books, and I'm going to give this one to anyone that would like to have it. And so uh, anyone want to uh, want, want to wrestle over it? or? <laughs> Okay, I'm not sure I'm going to split this up, maybe just carry it in half. All right, so but anyway, in this book, it talks about how Jesus was a radical, you know, he, he was radical in his ministry, and, and he was definitely radical in, in, in four different areas, but the thing I want to bring out today, he, he was radical in generosity. God was radical in generosity, so radical that he gave up his only begotten son. That's pretty radical. You know, when we think of radical, we think of someone who's crazy and, and uh, just, you know, just really out there. Well, that's not how I picture Jesus. Jesus was radical in the sense that he wasn't afraid to, to, to allow God to use him and to speak into people's lives. And so in this book that, that Mike Evans wrote, he wrote this about radical generosity. He said, to some, radical generosity may seem like a senseless act. What, they ask, how are you going to pay your bills if, you're abundant, you're, if you give abundant offerings to the Lord and to people in need? However, the Bible teaches that radical generosity opens the windows of heaven and brings God's overflowing blessing into your life. This can be, better, uh, this can be a better job, unexpected gifts from, uh, from friends or from relatives or even bargains when you shop. He says, your heavenly father wants to meet your needs. Radical generosity, he says, is a central part of the gospel itself. It really is. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And it as believers were told to follow God's example for sacrificial giving. He says this, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. That's in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. God gave us his only son. You talk about radical generosity, you can't get any more radical than that. He gave, and that's the principle that we get from, from, from not only from uh, you know, from what God did through his son Jesus, but all throughout the Bible, that when you give, God always gives back more than you could ever imagine or think. Press down, shaken together, and running over. Amen? And that's, that's our heart. And so as, as, we, as we're about to take up our offering, I just pray that God would bless you in any way that you may give. You know, the little lady that, in the Bible that, that she gave all that she had. It wasn't much, but she gave all she had, and God was able to bless her for what she gave, for what she gave. Amen? So let's pray right now. Father God, we thank you for, for everyone here today in this room and those watching online. Father, we thank you, God, for people that, have, that are radical in their generosity. God, not just in giving their tithes or their offerings, but God, in serving and meeting the needs of other people, helping someone and, and just blessing other people. Father, help us all to, to embrace that radical generosity that you so demonstrated as you gave your son, Jesus Christ, to us. Father, we thank you, God, for this day. 
Father, we ask you, Lord, to just to bless your people and give them favor. And, Father, over, overflow them, God, with your love and your generosity and your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. If you'd like to, to give, you're going to pass the basket around. If not, uh, we'll just leave the basket in the back. So, again, I want to thank you all for, uh, for joining us today. It's going to be a good day. You know, one of the, my favorite scriptures is Psalms 118.24, that today is the day, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I don't know about you, but there are some days I don't want to get out of bed. Amen. There are some days I just don't feel good. I just tired. I'm worn out. Didn't get much sleep. I got this little. I got this little uh, um, sleep app on my phone, and you know, it, and, and then you know, I wake up in the morning, and they ask, "Well, how well do you? How do? You, how did you feel like you slept last night? You know, good, not so good, or you know?" And I, I normally put in the in the middle sometimes, you know, not so good, and and it keeps track of how much how much sound sleep you I got, you know, but. Uh, there are days that, you know, I just feel wiped out and because they did, just eat, did a good night's sleep. But I don't care. No matter how bad you may feel, this is the day. I said, this is the day the Lord has made, and I will be glad and rejoice in it. And so you just go ahead and, and forget about that, maybe that, that rough night you had, that, forget about that, that bad week you had last week, and just know that this is a new day. This is a new day, and I'm going to rejoice in it. Amen? I, uh I heard something funny the other day, and uh, I thought this was, I thought, I'm going to go ahead and share this with you. Uh, this, this guy who said he was outside uh, waving at his neighbor uh, for about five minutes or so and didn't realize that she was washing her windows. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, that was, that's pretty good. I like that. And, and as, soon as, I, as soon as I read that, I, I immediately thought of my mother. And my mother, God rest her, she died last year, but she, uh, she died at 94 years old, and uh, I'll, I'll never forget this, though. We lived in Beaumont, Texas, and she came down to visit it one time, and she was probably in her late 80s or mid-80s, something like that, and she, man, she, she could get around. And uh, it wasn't until her last couple years that she just kind of slowed down a little bit, but she was, she was a go-getter her entire life. She just lived life to the fullest. She loved God, and, and she just uh, enjoyed life, you know. And, but she had a lot of energy, and she was a perfectionist, you know. She had to be things just, just so-so, and I think that's where I got, got it from, you know. And, uh, and, uh, but she came down and, and to, to visit us, and uh, she decided, well, I'll come help. Uh, you know, anything you need, need, need me to do around the house? Said, well, I got my windows. You know, you want to clean my windows for me? <laughs> And she did. Boy, she got on her little outfit, you know, and uh, her apron, and and uh, she was out there cleaning the windows. And uh, after she left, about a week or so after she left, I was talking to my neighbor. And my neighbor says, "You know, who was that lady cleaning your windows, man? She did a great job." I said, "Well, that was my mother, you know." And so, uh, anyway, I don't know how I got up talking about that. But... Well, last week uh, it was Easter Sunday. And uh, we began a series titled uh, "Love Reigns," and uh, we, you know, we celebrate together, you know, the miraculous resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Amen, and and the victory that He has brought uh, to our life because that He is alive today. And so we committed once again to live under the reign of Jesus' love. I said we have to commit to live under the the reign of Jesus' love. He loves us more than we could ever imagine or think, and when, and we need to remember that. So today we will continue uh, in this series in a way that, that, that God's, the love of God reigns over our past. That's my message today. Love, the love of God reigns over our past. Because Jesus' work on the cross, we do not have to be controlled by the mistakes, by the miscues of our life that happened maybe long ago, maybe that happened last week, or maybe even just happened this morning, you know? That God's love covers all that. We do not have to live in defeat. We don't have to live uh, because of our past mistakes and our blunders. Thank God for his forgiveness. Amen. Thank God for his love. But many people believe that their past is maybe a hindrance to their present and to their future. And, And it can be a heavy, heavy burden to bear when you feel weighed down by previous choices in your life. 
You know, one area in life where, we're, where uh, the past can have such a difficult consequence is in the sports, uh, the sports world. You know, most every sport on the earth has some story about a team, about a franchise, or about uh, an organization that had a bad stretch of luck because of something that happened in their past. And one example I want to share with you today is, is the team, uh, the Boston Red Sox baseball team. Back in 1919, we're talking a long time ago, the Boston Red Sox, they had a player called the Babe Ruth, right? And they ended up sell, uh, trading him to, to uh, the Yankees. And so for, from that time on, for 86 years, the Boston Red Sox never won a World Series. They were in an 86-year slump, right? And so for 86 years, they bore the, 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 the burden, and they believed that they could never get past their past of a selling Babe Ruth. Well, our past just... You know, our past doesn't just have to, you know, it doesn't just weigh us down in, in the sports. But many of us probably can point to one or maybe several different decisions that we may have had in our life uh, that has had an effect on our life, right? Some decisions are just maybe just mistakes that don't have many consequences in our life. But others, a little bit more drastic. Some others, a little bit more devastating effect that will affect our lives maybe for years to come. And so I, I thought of a story <clears> that I'll share with a personal story of my own. Back in 1990, I made a decision to quit teaching and go into full-time ministry. And, and that's what I did. And it was a decision Sharon and I knew it was a God thing. We knew that God was leading us to quit. Uh, I was a music teacher back then from 1985 to 1990. And, and we just knew that God was calling us out of that and into, into ministry. And we thank God for it. And that was a good decision. But I made another decision at that time. I decided to withdraw my Texas teaching retirement savings at that time that I had, I had earned about $8,300 at, up to that point. And I decided, you know, to, you know, uh, you know thinking that I would, I would never go back to teaching and that you know, what, what little that was, I thought, you know, you know, we'll make it up some other way. Well, now, I said, well, now, uh, I'm back teaching, and, and now I'm a little older, and uh, a little, that little extra cash come retirement time, I think might come a little handy. And so here's what I did. I, 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 I looked at about buying back those five years. And, and so I did a little research. I, I contacted the, the Texas Retirement, Teaching Retirement, and, and I found out that I could buy it back. And uh, so they sent me a letter last week, and, uh, and I found out that if I could come up with only $77,777, I could buy it back. $77,777, I can buy that $8,300 <laughs> back but no we wanted to buy furniture and if I hadn't listened to my wife's advice we would no 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 it's not her fault no, no. Woo. no I'm not going to go there it was a mutual decision there we, we both agreed that oh we needed that furniture and guess what we don't have that furniture anymore <laughs> we do not have that furniture anymore but you know what? That's not going to that's not going to affect our future. We, we, you know, yes, it would have been nice to have that, and and uh, thank God that you know, as much as my parents uh, tr tried to influence me and, and and encourage me and give me good tips on hey, save, save, save. And my parents, you know, uh, they they were savers back, you know. Uh, Back in the 1950s, you know, um, they saved everything. They invested, and, and uh, you know, again, God rest my parents, you know, they, they, they saved up so much money, invested so much money that uh, we able to benefit from, from that, me and my, my four siblings, and, and uh, thank God for that. And, uh, but I didn't listen to their advice in that in that area, and, uh, but I did listen to some of their advice that we know we did make some other investments, and uh, thank God for that, but we are not trapped into 
our past decisions. Yes, we have to pay the consequences for some of those decisions, you know, is this the way it is. But even if, you know, as much as we would love to maybe change the past, we can be assured that our past does not control, I said does not control our present nor our future. I said it does not control our present nor our future. God does. Okay? We do make bad decisions sometimes. And yes, we will pay the consequences on some of those decisions. You know, and if my, if my, uh, my advisor, you know, says, hey, I'll take some of this, this uh, money from your account and, and buy back those, I'll take his advice and, and see which, you know, what, what way is best for us. But you know what? God will find a way. God will make the best way. And so um, that's my message to today, that we're not... We are not bound by our past. The gospel, by the way, is full of stories, full of stories of individuals with shady past experiencing a fresh start in their life, amen, because of their interaction with Jesus. We can all have a fresh start with, with God. No matter what kind of bad decisions that we made, whether it was financial or emotional or relational, we can have a fresh start. The New Testament often speaks about the transforming power of Jesus' selfless sacrifice, amen, on the cross as he triumphed uh, through the resurrection, amen. And we can have that. When people place their trust in Jesus, they, they were different, they were, they were forgiven, and now they are made new. I said, when we put your faith and trust in God, you can be made brand new. It's the greatest news of all of our, of all of our, all of our decisions, all of our mistakes, all of our bad calls, that those that have caused guilt and maybe even shame in our life, it can all be nullified by our, by our faith in Jesus Christ. Nothing can keep us from what God has for us. Paul speaks this truth in 2 Corinthians. If you turn there, please, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. All right, it says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So Paul sets up this verse by bragging on God's amazing love that would offer Jesus' life to rescue ours. God's amazing love to us. He wants to rescue. He wants to help us, not only, in our, not only in our salvation, but in every aspect of our life. There is, this is where we find the word, therefore. It is because of God's love that we who are in Christ are a new creation. Therefore, therefore, if any was in Christ. You have to be in Christ. The phrase in Christ, by the way, is often used uh, in the New Testament it's news in the news. In fact, it's used over 216 times in Paul's letter. It's a way of showing a connection to Jesus and a union with Jesus. God wants to be connect, us to be connected to him and in union with him. Are you connected to Jesus? Have you made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? And are you in union with Jesus? There's a big difference of being connected to Jesus, but not really being in union with him. Amen? When we are united with Jesus because of our faith in him, we will experience a, a transformation that, that, will, that makes us new. It will make you new. Amen? It will, it will transform you into the image that God wants you. In order for this newness to be a reality, the old has to be removed. I think I shared last week that if you haven't changed, if you haven't seen some sort of transformation in your life, then I, I, I really doubt that you really had a, a good and a close encounter with God. You may have heard about God. I think I shared many times before that, you know, I went to church every single day, every single Sunday growing up. My parents were extremely faithful, and thank God for it. But I never really allowed for the Christ to be in Christ, to be in Christ. Thank God for you all being here today in church. But if you don't allow Jesus to be in you, if you don't allow Jesus to to be in union with Jesus Christ and allow him to transform your life, then you're, you're, you're not going to experience all that God has for you. You're not. The Holy Spirit gives them new life. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
The Holy Spirit gives us new life. And we're not the same anymore. We can be, we, we, we are not reformed, rehabilitated, or re, uh, just made, change a different form. We are transformed spiritually, recreated in a vital union with Jesus Christ. At conversion, we do not merely turn over a new leaf. It's not turning over a new leaf. It's a spiritual transformation that takes place. You know, and, and that's hard for our mind to grasp. I mean, there is so much that we don't understand because God is, is, is in such a totally different dimension. You know, there's things I just simply i am I'm dumbfounded. I, I don't have all the answers. And there's not a person on this earth that knows all the answers either. I'd be careful of, of being around people that say they do. You know, while the newness is, is true individually, and it is, it is true. When God touches your heart and transforms your life, it is something that, that God has transformed you individually. But it's much more than that. Not only are believers changed from within, but a whole new order of creation uh, or creative energy begins with Jesus Christ. There is a new covenant, amen? There is a new perspective. There is a new body. There is a new church, right? All of creation is being renewed. When Jesus came to this earth, I mean, everything about life and about this world was completely changed when Jesus conquered, conquered the grave. So we have to take notice of this. We have to be conscious of what Jesus and the principles of his word says in our life. This is not a super, uh, superficial change that takes place that will supersede by some novelty or some gimmick. No, this is a real change, something that's going to change your life. This is an entirely new order of all uh, creation under Jesus' authority. I mean, something fresh and new. It requires a new way of looking at people. It requires a new way of looking at life. It requires a new way of just looking at everything that we do. This is why discipleship is so very important. It's why learning what the Word says, learning what the principles of God, uh, uh, how they apply to our life is so important. It's more than just, you know, obviously getting saved and, and dedicating your life to Jesus is important. But if we don't learn this new way, this new uh, creative um, world that God has for us, we're going to miss out. And so does, you have to ask yourself, does your life reflect this new perspective? Does your life reflect this new thinking? Okay, unless you learn it, you're not going to know whether you're living and, and thinking in the world's way or if you're living and thinking God's way. Because let me tell you right now, God's way of thinking, God's way of doing things is completely opposite of what the world's way of doing things we live in this world. we got to live in this world. This is the way it is. But we don't have to be, you know, Jesus came to this earth, but he brought the kingdom of God with him. And we need to embrace that in our life. Does your life embrace the life-changing power that is available to us through the Holy Spirit? Man, I want more of God's presence in my life. I want, the, I want his Holy Spirit and his power and his glory to, to just saturate my life. So let me share with you today three points today about how God's love can reign over your past. Three things. Number one is out with the old and in with the new. Out with the old and in with the new. The love of God removes all sin. The love of God removes all shame. It removes all guilt. It removes all the mistakes and failures from our lives. He takes it out. It is gone, right? When God's love reigns in us, it overpowers that hold that those old things in our life had. And we have to realize that, that they're no longer there. You know, however it is, it has to be cleaned up. You know, those things in our life, those things that we're not happy with, it has to be cleaned up and, and made, given a space for where God can do a new thing in your life. But you've got to get it out. And it's only through the power of God that that can happen. My dad and my mom spent over 10 years, probably, probably 15 years, of remodeling their home. They bought a home back in 1954, and it was 100 years at that time. Okay, so it was an old home. 
And they didn't make homes back then the way they make homes today, right? They didn't have the sheetrock. They didn't have the plywood. They, they, they had, you know, the wooden slats with plaster on the inside, you know, and the, and the roof. Uh, you know, they had uh, not, not, the, not the plywood, but, but slats of wood, right? Slats of wood. And they just kind of, st- and, and then they put the shingles on top of that. They had, I remember the built-in gutters in their home. Built-in gutters. And so my dad, like I said, he, he did everything. He, he demoed everything, all right? And, and they, could, they could see past the old wallpaper, the rotten wood, the cracks in the walls, and, and the low ceilings, and, and all that. And so the first day in a remodel season is the day that the old has got to come out, right? How many remember the, the movie Fixer Upper? Chip Gaines, uh, his show, The Fixer Upper, right? And he made the phrase, Demo Day, right? Demo Day, he made it famous. And Demo Day is when you remodel begins and everything old is, remo- is removed. And my dad was, was a pro at that. And my dad, uh, I was telling Greg that my dad was an uh, uh, electrician by trade, but he could do anything. He could do everything. He was a carpenter. He was a plumber. He, was, he just did everything. And, and uh, my mom made sure that, that uh, she put him to work. And, uh, and dad put us to work growing up as kids. You know, I'll, I'll never forget one summer my dad, actually it took him two summers, uh, to, to redo his roof. And I said he, he, re- he did everything on his roof. I mean, he took off just, not just the shingles, but the wood slats and put down uh, the 4x8 the plywood and all that and took out the building gutters. And, and so that was a project. And so we got the scaffolding, and my brother and I, you know, we helped Dad out. And, and, uh, I, and I was probably in junior high at the time, and, and my job mainly was a gopher. And uh, go for this tool and go for that tool and, you know, that kind of thing. And, and uh, every now and then I would swing a hammer or pull something up. But, uh, but I remember, I'll never forget, one summer I was sitting on top of that two-story house and sitting on the roof. And, and it was summertime and looking out over my neighborhood. And I could see my friends out playing, riding their bikes. And here I was, I was like, man, here I am, sweating on this roof, helping my dad. And I'm missing out on all the fun. But thank God for that experience. Oh, my gosh, thank God for that experience. I thank God that, um, yeah, yeah, sure, it would have been nice to be out on riding my bike, but I thank God that I was, I, I was with my dad, yes. you know. And he taught me things, you know. I didn't know he was teaching me things at the time, but he was teaching me things, you know. And, and I learned how to be a carpenter. I, I learned some electrical skills and plumbing skills and all that. But um, get back to my story, though, demo day. Demo day is when remodel begins and, and everything old is removed, oftentimes by force to make way for some new material. We need some new material in our life. We need something, we need something new, something fresh, something from God. And we've got to get rid of that old before that can be placed. When God comes into our life, he does not simply overlook our sinful past, right? He doesn't cover up, you know, that old flooring. No, he rips it up and puts new stuff in. This is an important concept that we have to get and deeply understand about our Christian walk. Otherwise, that some of that old stuff may start to come back into our life, you know? Philippians 3.13 says this, Forgetting what is behind and looking forward to what's ahead. I don't have that on my screen, I don't think. But it's Philippians 3.13. Look it up. Paul's talk, saying this. Paul saying, forgetting what is behind. How many know that Paul... Was he hunted down Christians? He had a lot of stuff in his past that that was bad, right? And thank God for God's forgiveness. He didn't just cover up what Paul did. No, he forgave what Paul did. He was a murderer of Christians, and then he became one. And Paul's saying, "I'm forgetting what is behind, and I'm looking forward to what is ahead." How many times do we hang on to some of those things in our life that we're not proud of, but yet the devil keeps you know, trying to tell you you're a dirty old dog and, and you don't deserve God's love and grace, and he tries to put that on you? No, you are free from that. But the devil, man, he wants, to, he wants, to, he wants you to have that ball and chain where you feel like you are dragging that past around with you for the rest of your life, keeping you from what God wants you to do in your life. We have to realize that when we confess our past, our current sins to Jesus, we will experience his radical forgiveness. Amen? We need his radical forgiveness. To confess means to agree with God. 
I said to confess means that we agree with God. When we confess, we acknowledge that old sinful ways are just that. They're old and outdated. They're done with. When we confess, we agree to allow God to replace those sinful ways with godly ways that are new and within it and are better. Amen? We go from telling lies to speaking the truth. We go from being selfish to being selfless. We go from spreading gossip to encouraging people and building people up. We go from, from, from a burning anger to being filled with joy and peace. Joy and peace. You know, I could, I could allow that, that stupid mistake I did back in 1990 when I took that money out and, 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 just, and just, be, just let it eat me up alive, you know? Man, how could you do that? My parents, you know, they... They just shook their head. <laughs> That's all they did. You know, they, they shook their head when I told them I did that. But you know what? God, God looks past that. And he, can, and he can do something new in your life. When remodeling a house, it's important to remove any of the old and rotten pieces and replace it with new, fresh material. You know what? Duct tape doesn't last forever. <laughs> it does not last forever. I mean, you can patch it up for a little while, but guess what? It's going gonna, it's gonna to come back and, and bite you. Now, when we try to live as a new creation while holding on to our past vices, we end up frustrated. We end up uh, hurting our relationship with God and not allowing God to really do a work in our life. Because we're still hanging on. That's why so many new Christians never really experience a fullness of God in their life. Because they're still hanging on to those things that they did, uh, that they did uh, while they were living for the world. They're still hanging on to it. They're still hanging on to it. We have to allow God to remove it all. I said we have to allow God to remove it all. I said we have to allow God to remove it all. Tear it up, get it out, and, and start new. Allow God to do something new in your life. Start fresh with a, with a renewed heart, amen? Start fresh with a new way of life, a new covenant with Jesus Christ, and instill with us a new desire and a new passion and love for God. Get rid of it all. Get rid of it. Turn to uh, Psalms 103, verse 12. The Bible says, says it like this. As far as the east is from the west... So far has he removed our transgressions from us. He removes it. As far as the east is from the, from the west. That's a long way, right? It is gone. We, have to, we, have, we do not have to walk around defeated. We don't have to walk around defeated and full of shame anymore. There are so much things in my life that I did in my past that would be extremely shameful. I'd hate to admit. But you know what? I'm forgiven of that. I'm not going to allow the devil to put that ball and chain on me ever again. And you need to do the same thing. Cut it loose. Ain't no devil. I am forgiven from that. Forgiven from sin. Forgiven from addiction. Forgiven from whatever that has kept you bound. You are forgiven from it. Let it go. Let it go. I feel like singing a song, right? Let it go, right? You, we are a new creation. New. It's your past. Your past does not control your present nor your future. Doesn't. Let it go. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 through 20. 2 Corinthians 5, 18. It says this. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, drawing, him, drawing us to himself, reconciling, not in putting their trespasses on them, and has committed to us the, the word of reconciliation. Verse 20, now then, we are, say, I am. I am, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God was pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. This is all God's gracious gift, man. It's all about him. It's his gift to us. He reconciles us. That means that we're getting past, it, it, 
that getting past our past is not something that we do on our own. It's not something we do on our own. We cannot overcome our mistakes or make, or, or make up for them by doing good works, in other words. You can be the best person in the world. That's not going to get rid of those past mistakes. God has reconciled us to himself. God is the one, not our works. Amen? God says our, our good works are like filthy rags. No matter how good you may treat other people, no matter, no matter how many good things you do for other people, they're like filthy rags in God's sight. Only God's righteousness can, can turn us around. God brings us back to himself by blotting out our sins, by taking away our sins, and making us right with him. No one else and nothing can, it could ever do that. The subject of radical forgiveness um, cannot be complete without talking about forgiving yourself. Forgiving yourself. You know, sometimes forgiving ourselves is harder than, than forgiving other people. You will never be able to move forward with God, to live a life of love and to live a life of grace until you are able to, for, to forgive yourself and get past your past. We all make mistakes. We do. But don't allow the devil to, to put guilt and condemnation on you. If you allow your, your failures, your mistakes to fester, it will just eventually just eat you up alive. Let it go. The, you know, the, as I said, the enemy wants to use unforgiveness as, as a stepping stone to eat away at your faith and in God's love and mercy for you. And, and you begin to think that, well, I, I'm not, I can't forgive myself. How can God forgive me? And that's, that's wrong thinking. You can forgive yourself, and God most certainly will forgive you. It's when we confess our sins to Jesus Christ that he forgives us, and we can experience his restored relationship with him. Amen? Point two, God's love for us and God's love through us. God's love reigns in our life. It's God's love for us and God's love through us. God is interested in the entire world being reconciled to him. The entire world. He does not want anyone to live a life weighed down by a sinful past or shackled by shame and guilt. Not a single person. He sent his son to die on the cross for everyone. And God extended his grace through, to us through Jesus Christ's death and his resurrection. Now we... The scripture says we are to be ambassadors, right? We are to implore others to confess their sins and, and, and reconcile them to God as well. It's not our responsibility, but it's our responsibility to share that and what God has done in your life. A love for God is better caught, by the way, than taught. I said the love of God is better, is better caught than taught. You can try to teach people about God, but when you start sharing the love of God, they're going, to, they're, going to be, they're going to be more open to receive from God. People want to see you live it out in your life. They want to see you live it out. When, when we can tell people all day long that we love them. We can tell people all day long about, about what God can do for you, but unless you start showing what, what God has done for you, they'll begin to see it. A love for God is contagious. It needs to be contagious. People want to hear that it means something to you. I thank God for what God did in my life. You know, I don't have to share my full testimony, but, you know, when I, when I was my first year in teaching, 1985, 1986, I uh, went to spring break, and, and uh, I, was, I wasn't a Christian at that time, and I was... I went to New Orleans. I wanted to go party with my college friend Larry, and, and uh, I wanted to have a good time down there. I, I wanted to go down to Bourbon Street and celebrate, you know. I had a whole week of being on uh, spring break, you know, and, and uh, I, I, like I said, I wasn't a Christian back then, right? I didn't have that relationship. And so I went down there to visit my friend Larry, and, and what did Larry do? He takes me to a home Bible study on a Friday night. At, at Larry! I want to go downtown and, and party and, and have a good time. And, and so that, that didn't happen. So Saturday comes around, so here's, here's my chance. No, I went to some 
I went to another home group on a Saturday night. I thought, oh, my gosh, what's going on, Larry? I said, I, I only have a few days down here with you. I said, come on, let's do something. Well, Sunday comes around, well, let's go to church. <laughs> so I go to church with Larry on a Sunday morning at nice Assembly God Church, and it was packed out, you know, and I said, Larry, I'll, uh, you know, i got to leave on Monday. He said, let, let's, let's do something. And I say, well, let's go back to church on Sunday night. Oh. So we go to church on Sunday night, and uh, the church is packed out. I mean, there wasn't a chair, chair of, actually it was pews in that church, and, and every pew was full. And uh, Larry and, and his wife and, and I, we sat on the very last pew. I mean, probably 150 people in that little church. And, and, uh, and uh, at the end of the message, the preacher asked about salvation, and my hand went up and went back down, just that fast. But it was long enough for that preacher to, to notice my hand. I don't know how he did. You know, like I say, I was way in the back, couldn't get back any further. And uh, it wasn't up for about a second, and it was down again. And uh, I heard this call, the, the, the preacher saying, hey, Larry, come on up to the front. And uh, so Larry goes up, and, and he said, Larry, I, you know, your friend raised his hand. And so Larry came back, and he led me to the Lord. And, uh, and he'll do that for you. He'll do that for you. He, he will change your life. You know, if I were to ask you to tell someone next to you about your favorite movie or your favorite sport or your favorite activity, you would probably wouldn't have any problem doing that right now, right? Because you, you like it, you're passionate about it. But if I were to ask you to share something personal about your life with someone in this room right now, maybe a, a recent uh, speeding ticket or uh, something like that, you know, you probably wouldn't feel very comfortable, right? And my whole point is that we, when we're passionate about something, man, it just comes out. It's just going to come out. You, you don't be afraid about sharing the love of God, that what, how God has touched your life. Just let, just let it come out. You know, when a person really loves something or loves someone, they cannot help but, but tell other people about it. You know, you can't. I, I, love tell, I love sharing my story about how Jesus changed my life. Tell your story. Amen. Tell your story because each one of you has a story to tell. You know, you don't have to be long and drawn out, but simply tell your story. How does God, how, how has the love of God changed your life? Share how maybe God has changed your past, and wiped away those things in your life. Let people know who you were before, Jesus, and then tell them who you are now. But you gotta, you got to make sure, though, that that transformation is taking place. <laughs> right? You have to make sure that transformation is taking place, you know, and uh, that there, there's something that they can see. But don't try to be that secret disciple, right? Don't be that secret disciple. Jesus died for you publicly. Guess what? He wants you to live for him publicly. I said, Jesus d died on the cross for you publicly, but we need to live for him publicly. Jesus wants to make his appeal to the world through your life, through your life. It's made possible through what Jesus has done in our life. Amen? Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says, For he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So when we trust in Jesus, we make an exchange, right? He takes our sin and makes us right with God. I said, he takes our sin and then he makes us right. For, that's, that's a pretty good deal, right? That's a good deal. Our sin was laid on Christ on that crucifixion. Jesus took our sin. He took our mistakes. He took our brokenness. He took our hurt. He took our sickness and all of our past, and he nailed it to the cross as he hung there on the, on the tree. He became the sin on our behalf, even though he was perfect and he was sinless. It was an act of love for him to die for us, even though we all were sinners. Every single one of us. So this leads me to my last and third point. Our wrongness is replaced by God's righteousness. Our wrongness is replaced by God's righteousness. There is an incredible exchange that takes place at the cross of Calvary. Jesus takes everything wrong about us, everything about our past, and he puts into us his righteousness the righteousness of God. 
The Greek meaning behind this righteousness is the idea that we are approved in the eye of God. We are approved in the eye. His righteousness is his divine approval. Again, we can't do anything to make up for those, those sinful things in our life. It has to come from his righteousness. And there may be some of us here today that have those things in our life that maybe are keeping us back, and we need the righteousness of God to set us free. God does not see you in your sin, sinful past. He sees you in the eyes of righteousness. He looks through the blood of Jesus. He looks through the blood of Jesus and sees you as forgiven. I'm going to close with this little story. I read a story about a company that made, uh, made cake mix for sale in a grocery store. And they expected to be have this wildly successful, but because their ingredient list uh, instructions they were so simple, they thought well, if we make it, if we make this this cake mix so simple that people will just buy it up. It's going to be it's going to be a great hit. And all the all the people had to do was add water. That was it. And to their surprise, sales slumped. And they did not sell as, as much as they anticipated, right? And after doing some research, they found that their customers were just a little uneasy about buying a cake and only having to add water to it. It just seemed too easy. It seemed way too easy. It can't be that good, right? Add water to it. And so they changed the ingredient. They changed the instructions. Not only do you add water, but now just you add a single egg. And their sales spiked. That was it. The egg, right? The egg. And it made their sales go, you know, great success. I found that a lot of people think the truth that God has, has their forgiveness is, is passed by their life, their death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is too good. It's just too good to be true. Far too simple to trust. Just like that cake recipe. It was just, no, it's, that's, that's too easy. But you know, God has made it easy. Well, it made it easy on our part. All we have to do is simply accept Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, accept his forgiveness into our life. What he did was not so easy. What he went through was not easy. But he has made it easy for us. And so many people are thinking, no, there's got to be more to it. There's got to be more to it. I, I can't, that's, no. What Jesus did for us. Let's bow our head and let's pray. Father God, we are so thankful that your love reigns in our heart and that we can be free from our sinful past, dear God. We can, you, you can set us free, dear God, by inputting to us your righteousness and your forgiveness where every sin, every bad thought, every bad decision that we've ever made, dear God, is totally wiped away and that we are forgiven by, by your love, dear God. We thank you that you sent your son Jesus to take our sins, to take our sins on the cross and for, to forgive us of all of our unrighteousness. So, Father, we come here t today, dear God, thanking you, God, that you have cleansed us of our sins. You have made us brand new. We are made new, and you've made it so simple for us, God, to come to you by simply believing in, in you, believing in your way, dear God, and confessing you as our Lord and Savior. I never want to close down service without giving you the opportunity. If you are here today or if you're watching us online, that if you have never turned your life over to Jesus Christ, you need to do it. You need to do it. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. Today can be your day of salvation if you just simply trust in God. Don't worry about about how it's going to be done. Jesus has already paid the price. All you have to do is simply put your faith and trust in him, knowing that he died on the cross for your sins and that you are forgiven. Simply say this prayer with me today. Lord Jesus, I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I thank you, God, that you have forgiven me of every sin that I've ever committed in my life. Dear God, you have made me a brand new creature in Christ because I surrender my life to you and I accept your son, Jesus Christ, into my heart. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said amen. amen. 
I want to ask you here today before, as we close that if there's anyone here today that still feels bound by some of those things in your past, it's to let it go. To let it go. Allow and know that the power of God can set you free and will set you free. I, I can pray for you all day long, but it's up to you to put your faith and trust in God to say, I let it go. I do pray for you. But don't allow the devil to, to put that ball and chain on you and keeping those things in your past from what God has for your future. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for being us, with us here today. Let me share a couple of things with you uh, before I uh, dismiss you. Uh, again, I'm going to remind you about our prayer Call 714 this Wednesday morning. Just simply call that number. Go ahead and show that. Rob, if you would, please call that number, that access code, and just listen in. Be part of our corporate prayer and, uh, and be blessed uh, our midweek. I also want to remind you that if you would please, please, please take these, okay? We are a new church. We are a new church. Regina, thank you for, for, for posting what I posted yesterday on Facebook. You know, it's little things like that that you just make contact with people, and people are going to see that we got something here, and we just know that we're going to do something in this community. We're going to do something in Colleen, but it takes one step at a time. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and we are putting our faith and trust in God that this is a good work, and our, our greater days are ahead of us. Amen? And so thank you for taking these. Put them in someone's hand. This week, there's a bunch back there. Take as many as you'd like and get those uh, uh, in people's hands. And again, be in prayer with us as we begin to start our kids and youth ministry. Uh, we are planning some events that are going to be taking place uh, very shortly. So um, we know that you know, we just need to reach out and do things. And so uh, we would love for you to be a part of our team. We'd love for you to be in the groundwork of what God is going to do in our, in our life and through, uh, through our lives. Amen. And so uh, go ahead and stand. Let's go ahead and pray. Let me bless you today. Lord, I ask you, God, just to bless your people today. Father, bless them. And Father, that your good hand be upon them, dear God. Bless them and keep them. Crown them with your loving kindness and your tender mercy. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. That you may be full of God's hope by the power of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen, amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful week.